Welcome to 2016, the first lecture this year in the conference. It's, uh, we'll talk about assessment of diastolic function, something that is done routinely and frequently. It's good to start with a basic understanding of what determines the signals that we acquire. And then we move on to look at these signals and the, their application in different uh, diseases. So the top panel shows the pressure in the left ventricle in red, pressure in the left atrium in yellow, interrupted lines from a normal dog. During the closure of the aortic valve and before the mitral valve opens, there is a rapid decline in LV pressure in normal hearts, leading to a very low pressure called the minimal pressure. This minimal pressure depends on active properties of the myocardium, how fast there is calcium uptake by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It also depends on something we call suction. If you get a spring, you compress it and you release the spring, it expands again. This helps filling of the ventricle. The pressure called minimal pressure can be measured by high fidelity pressure catheters most accurately as opposed to fluid filled catheters which you use in your regular cath procedures. At this point called the crossover point, crossover because at this point the LA pressure is equal to the LV pressure and now the mitral, the LA pressure is higher than the LV pressure. There is a positive gradient. Notice that this gradient is small, but is still enough to fill the left ventricle because of these active properties and passive properties of a normal ventricle. And then there is a period of equalization of pressures called diastasis. In normal hearts, as you see here, the two pressures overlap, so there is really no pressure difference. And then with LA contraction, there is another positive pressure gradient that develops in late diastole, ending up with the end diastolic pressure. The highest pressure in the ventricle is the end diastolic pressure. The lowest pressure is the minimal pressure. The pressure in the left ventricle before atrial contraction is referred to as the pre-A pressure, A for atrial contraction. This pressure is very similar to the pressure in the left atrium, mean left atrial pressure, is close to the wedge pressure, and can be reliably measured as well as the EDP with regular fluid-filled catheters. For the heart, flow start, follows pressure gradients. So once a positive pressure gradient is present, the mitral valve opens and flow happens in early diastole. In late diastole, after this positive pressure gradient is recorded because of atrial contraction, another forward flow sets in. There is a lag because of inertia of the blood between when the gradient develops, when the highest gradient is present, and when actual flow happens. The bottom panel is from an animal in failure, and you notice that here the pressure gradient in early diastole is smaller than the pressure gradient that you see in the normal heart. Why is it a smaller pressure gradient? Because the LV minimal pressure is higher. This is a diseased heart. It doesn't relax as fast. And so for the same time period that you allow the pressure to drop, you end up with a higher pressure in the diseased heart. To allow for forward flow to continue, because flow happens when there is a positive pressure gradient, the left atrial pressure goes up. So that mean left atrial pressure, and here the LAV wave pressure sets in. This is the Y decline that you see. And then we get the period of diastasis, and we get into late diastole. Notice, because this is a stiffer ventricle, once you send flow into the ventricle from the atrium, the LV pressure rises fast. Compare this slow rise with this fast rise to the extent that you can end up with a higher end diastolic pressure than atrial pressure. What does that do? 
It results in no forward flow across the mitral valve in late diastole, typically premature closure of the mitral valve, and these hearts have abbreviated diastolic filling periods, and because of these abbreviated diastolic filling periods, plus the smaller pressure gradients, the actual stroke volume can drop in these hearts. So now, what do we want to get out of an echocardiographic examination? We want to come up with statements about, is relaxation normal? Is it abnormal? The word diastolic function or dysfunction is a broad term. When we speak about diastolic function, we should speak about relaxation. Is it normal or abnormal? Stiffness, is it normal or elevated? Virtually all hearts with myocardial disease have both elements present, impaired relaxation as well as increased stiffness. So we have several signals, and these several signals have a lot of variables that determine them. The challenge is to use the variables that we have to draw conclusions about diastolic function. We'll start with the mitral inflow. The mitral inflow follows the LA, LV pressure gradients that you saw in a normal heart. Typically, you have a rapid rise in the mitral E velocity. You have a rapid decline in the E velocity, we call the rise acceleration and the decline deceleration. We can measure acceleration time and deceleration time, or we can measure acceleration rate and deceleration rates. The rates, in addition to time intervals, include velocities. We also can measure the E to A ratio, and the time interval between these two arrows, which is the isovolumic relaxation time, an isovolumic relaxation time is short in normal hearts, but in diseased hearts with normal LA pressure, it, is, it gets prolonged, as you see here. The E to A ratio drops because of the reasons that we discussed in the relation between the LA and LV pressure gradients. Acceleration time, deceleration time get longer, and the rates get lower. To compensate and allow more forward flow, LA pressure rises, and here you get a higher pressure gradient in early diastole compared to the middle phase. The price that the heart pays for this is a higher LA pressure. For patients, this translates to symptoms of pulmonary congestion. And here we have even higher E velocity and lower A velocity, a ratio of frequently more than one, and in restrictive filling defined by more than two. Very short acceleration, deceleration times, high acceleration, deceleration rate, and a short isovolumic relaxation time. This is a dynamic situation. So if a patient decompensates, they can go from this inflow pattern to the restrictive pattern, or pseudo-normal pattern. When we treat them, say you give them diuretics, then they can revert back to the impaired relaxation pattern. So this is a first clue that we often look at when we try to assess diastolic function. The point I want to emphasize is these inflow patterns are not interpreted in vacuum. Before you start drawing conclusions using the inflow patterns, you want to look at the clinical history and also the findings that you see by 2D echocardiography as we will get into that. Pulmonary veins, this records flow from the vein into the left atrium. So there is forward flow in systole and diastole. Why? Because there is a positive pressure gradient between the vein and the left atrium. When the atrium contracts late in diastole, it sends blood backwards. So this is flow from the atrium into the vein, and we get an A velocity. In patients with diastolic dysfunction, the earliest pressure to go up is the LV and diastolic pressure. They may still have normal mean diastolic pressures. And in the presence of normal LA contraction, normal LA function, the A velocity becomes quite prominent, both in absolute value, in duration, and of course, with both being increased, the time velocity integral as well. We're looking at a velocity that exceeds 35 centimeters per second. The caveat to looking at the A prime velocity, assuming that you have a good signal, is to look at the LA function 
and try to factor it in. Sometimes you can have patients with high EDP, but they have LA systolic dysfunction, and because of that, that A velocity may not be prominent. As diastolic dysfunction progresses, LV EDP is up, but also now the mean LV diastolic pressures, the LA pressure goes up, and here forward flow happens mostly in diastole, not in systole. Why? Because in systole the mitral valve is closed, which means that the LA pressure is up. So there is little chance for blood to go forward from the vein to the atrium. In diastole, the mitral valve opens, and now the atrium can empty and therefore can accept blood from the vein. Example from a patient with heart failure, depressed ejection fraction. You see a small systolic higher diastolic velocity. You see an atrial reversal velocity that is approaching the 35 centimeters per second with a rather long duration. Another valuable thing you look at in the pulmonary veins is how fast that, the, that diastolic velocity drops. This is related to LA stiffness. A stiffer left atrium results in a rapid drop in that diastolic velocity, and because a stiff left atrium is usually associated with a high left atrial pressure, a short decel time of the diastolic velocity is also associated with a high LA pressure. Example from a patient with diastolic heart failure or heart failure preserved EF is shown here. The one thing that catches your attention is the mitral A velocity. It's a very short duration. But if you compare it to the atrial reversal velocity, this is a very large wave, peak value 50 centimeters per second, and duration way exceeds that of mitral inflow. Because these are two measurements, and each one can come with its own errors, inexperienced operators or investigators or whoever is going to perform the measurement may have lower reproducibility on these time intervals. But you need crisp signals and you need to match RR intervals. There can be minor variations in cycle length even in patients in sinus rhythm as we frequently see. The time interval, the magic value that tells us that the LV EDP is increased is if that AR duration exceeds mitral A duration by at least 30 milliseconds. Sometimes it's visually clear to you without having to do measurements. Sometimes it's more subtle and you have to do the measurements. Example from a patient who got treatment presented with restrictive filling, predominant diastolic, after treatment of heart failure with diuretics and some vasodilators, you now notice a low E to A ratio. In fact, the peak E velocity is very low, barely 40 centimeters per second. And look at the pulmonary venous flow. Predominant flow is systolic. So both signals give us concordant information. Another variable that we look at and record routinely in the exam is tissue Doppler. And you can acquire tissue Doppler with color as well as with the pulse wave Doppler spectral display that you see here. This is the signal that we depend on. To get a good quality signal, you have to get a correct sample size. You have to get a correct location. Not infrequently, people in a hurry will have a signal where part of the signal is inside the ventricle, or part of it is outside the ventricle. Sometimes it's in the atrium. None of that is good enough. You have to place it at the lateral side of the mitral annulus to acquire the signal. Quickly going through the signals that we acquire, remember the transducer is sitting at the apex. So first, during systole, there is an annular descent. The long axis of the ventricle is shortening, is decreasing. And so you get the systolic velocity. During the QRS, there is an isovolumic contraction signal. And then during the ejection phase, you get a systolic ejection velocity. During diastole, there is recoil. The, apex, the annulus moves away from the apex. The ventricle is expanding. This long axis is increasing. And you can notice a small velocity during isovolumic relaxation time and much easier velocity to recognize in early diastole and in late diastole. It is the early diastolic velocity that has garnered more attention of these signals that you see. As you can tell, you can acquire it in the annulus, and we acquire it at the septal and lateral sides of the annulus. You can also acquire it in the myocardium. 
when you acquire it in the myocardium, you are looking more at myocardial segmental function as opposed to global function. Even when you are acquiring it at the annulus, it is still more heavily affected by the wall from which the signal is acquired as opposed to global LD function, hence the effort to average signals from different locations. Now let us look at what are the variables that affect this velocity. This is a normal dog, and we're recording signals here from the lateral early diastolic velocity A for annulus because EA can also stand for vascular elastance to avoid confusion. This ASE has gone with the terminology lowercase e prime velocity. But there is the baseline. With IVC occlusion, you decrease the venous return. And when you decrease the venous return, the flow into the heart drops, stroke volume drops, LA pressure drops. And you see that the early diastolic velocity, both in absolute value, duration, and TVI drops. So what does that slide show? It shows that it is dependent on loading conditions in a normal heart. How about the effect of LV relaxation? If you enhance relaxation with a drug like dobutamine, notice the faster heart rate, the early diastolic velocity goes up. If you drop relaxation with esmolol, that the early diastolic velocity drops down. So now it also is affected by relaxation. The question comes, if it's affected by preload and if it's affected by relaxation, how different is it from the mitral inflow? And does it add independent information to mitral inflow? This is where it adds, or why it adds, independent information to mitral inflow. In the setting of esmolol injection, esmolol is a drug that depresses cardiac function. Notice that with IVC occlusion, the early diastolic velocity changes little, if any. So now what we are looking at is a signal that is affected by preload or by LV filling pressures when LV relaxation is normal, but not when LV relaxation is impaired. It is also affected by the myocardial lucitropic properties, how good or how fast the heart is relaxing. This is a summary of the hemodynamic determinants, and there have been several studies, most recently 2013, looking at these determinants as well in animal models. And the consensus is that it is affected with relaxation, better relaxation, which means a shorter time constant of LV relaxation and more negative DPDT, the higher the early diastolic velocity. It is also affected by LV minimal pressure. We used LV minimal pressure here as a surrogate for LV suction which is more challenging to measure as a pure variable. But you also notice that in ventricles with high LV minimal pressures, typically dysfunctional ventricles, that velocity is reduced. The counterpart of this data from patients is shown here. This is a group of individuals, some were normal, some had coronary disease in the setting of MIs, E to A ratio less than one or more than one, and what you're looking at is an inverse relation between that velocity and the time constant of LV relaxation. Our value here was about 0.7 to 0.8, so very similar to what you saw in humans, in animals. These are animal data going back and forth between animals and humans so you can see the resemblance and why the human re on how to interpret or why we interpret the human results the way we have interpreted them you're looking here at the transmitral pressure gradient measured by a catheter in the la and the lv and we're looking at the early diastolic velocity the solid line and the solid circles show the relation between the pressure gradient and the velocity and you see a direct relation in the setting of a short time constant, that is, in the setting of a normal LV. However, in the setting of a prolonged time constant, so LV dysfunction, you are looking at the interrupted line and the open circles, and you see a scatter plot of points, not much of an effect of a transmitral gradient on the early diastolic velocity. The counter part of that in humans is shown on that slide. These were 60 patients, variable degrees of LA of mean wedge pressure anywhere from five to more than 40 millimeters mercury, but all of them with diastolic dysfunction, some normal, some depressed EF. And you see a scatter plot similar to what you saw in animals with impaired LV relaxation. 
So now let us look at E to E prime ratio and how it is derived and what, what it adds or why it adds to assessment of LAP. The mitral E velocity relates directly with the left atrial pressure. The E, pro, the e mitral E velocity relates inversely with the time constant of LV relaxation. I'm sorry? Can I finish my point and then we talk sure. about it? Because I've got... Okay, there are some slides that were coming, but we can talk about it now. So the annular early diastolic velocity happens because of a recoil of the mitral annulus with ventricular expansion in the lung axis. In the setting of LV dysfunction, this annular recoil, this expansion of the LV lung axis is delayed. The delaying of the expansion throws the early diastolic velocity movement at the time of diastasis when there is no pressure gradient and therefore it is not affected by LV filling pressures at that time. That was shown in dog experiments and was also shown in some human studies both by us and by other investigators. So we'll see how we can use this time interval as well or be it more challenging in acquisition. So we covered the first two points, and these were from the early slides, nothing new about them. And we can say that E is directly related to the ratio of LAP to the time constant of LV relaxation. Since tau relates inversely with EA, we can also express it as LAP divided by 1 over EA. And you rearrange this, you end up E being proportional to the product of these two variables. We are not interested in E or E prime per se. We are interested in the estimate of LAP. So you rearrange that expression and you end up with that ratio. As you see, this is a velocity and this is a velocity, so it's a dimensionless parameter. It has no units. And that's the correlation between that ratio and wedge pressure. Again, some patients depressed EF, some normal EF variable grades of diastolic dysfunction, some impaired, some pseudonormal, some restrictive. And the rectangle marks a zone between 8 and 15 ratio where there is a scatter, not a good prediction of what the pressure is based on the E to E prime ratio, but lower values than 8, higher values than 15 track well. This is an early publication from 2000 from the Mayo Clinic showing similar results, less than 8, more than 15 between, a ratio between 8 and 15. This is for septal E to E prime. The solid circles are for patients with EF more than 50, the open circles EF less than 50%. And you can see that for those more than 15, virtually all of them with the exception of very few had an elevated mean LV diastolic pressure. Now this is in general. Any variable that we look at or any parameter that we look at has its own limitations. The following slides will highlight some of these limitations of the E to E prime. So one of these is in patients with abnormal septal motion. These are patients with a left bundle branch block or RV pacing. And what you notice is that the septal E to E prime ratio relates significantly and rather good correlation with the wedge pressure in patients without the bundle branch block, left bundle or RV pacing. On the other hand, a wide scatter and lower ability to predict pressure, even though you have a wide range of wedge pressures in these cases still. The same applies if you were to look at the lateral ratio. I just cut it shorter for the sake of time so we can cover more topics. More recently, this, we looked at that in patients with acute decompensated heart failure. So these were patients with depressed EF admitted to the hospital with heart failure who had cath and echo Doppler. We're looking at the average E to E prime ratio. In the absence of bundle branch block or CRT, you see a decent relation, albeit not a, a linear relation. Whereas you see a much wider spread and lower correlation in patients with left bundle branch block or CRT. So that's a thing when you look at studies you want to pay attention to. How good is tissue Doppler for detecting 
an elevated mean LAP. This was a unique study. It's a small number of patients, but they had actually transducers implanted in the left atrium, and they were able to track the left atrial pressure with day-to-day -day activities. You're looking at the ability of different ratios to predict an elevated LAP, a mean LAP more than 15 millimeters mercury. And you can see that several parameters had decent abilities to do so. The best, though not necessarily statistically significant differences, were for the average E to E prime ratio as well as for medial and lateral E to E prime ratio. These were patients in heart failure with variable degrees of decompensation. Some compensated, some were decompensated. Looking at individual data points from that study, you can see a decent tracking most of the time between E to E prime ratio on the septal side and left atrial pressure. Can you use the mitral inflow, the E to E prime ratio, the TR, the things that we depend on in regular patients and patients with LVAD? This is recent work done with Dr. Estep and showing you an example of data acquired from a patient with a wedge pressure of 20. Look at the E to A ratio, a high ratio, more than two, an E to E prime ratio of 15, and a TR of about 2.9 with an elevated RAP. By the way, the TR by itself of a, of a 2.9 is usually associated with a high left atrial pressure. In comparison, someone with a ratio with a wedge of nine, you have a ratio less than one, an E to E prime of nine, and a lower TR velocity at 2.4. This is an algorithm in LVAD patients looking at several parameters that can be combined. It's a small study, and certainly additional work needs to be looked at to refine it. But the general concepts that we apply can still apply here, but you need to be more careful of the signal acquisition and the quality of the signals because not infrequently, LVAD patients are more challenging to acquire. Many a time, people spend time trying to measure the velocities and look at the signals, but if the signal is of a poor quality, it doesn't help to measure a poor quality signal. You do not measure it, and you do not use it to draw conclusions. Just because you have something before you doesn't mean you should measure it and put your faith in it. If you like the signal, if there are no technical issues with it, if it is clear, then you can measure it and work with it. So summary slide on tissue Doppler velocities. The sample volume should be placed at or one centimeter within the septal and lateral insertion sites. There should be no angulation. This is a Doppler technique. You have angulation. You have lower velocities. Septal and lateral velocities should be acquired by pulse wave Doppler. In ventricles with diastolic dysfunction and even in normal ventricles, as the example I showed you earlier, there can be a prominent isovolumic relaxation signal. So you need to spend time to look carefully. Is this velocity an E prime or is it an IVR signal, isovolumic relaxation velocity signal? Then look at the absence or presence of regional dysfunction. These affect the velocities. Sometimes averaging helps. Sometimes even when you average it is not as accurate. Then there are a group of diseases where the E to E prime ratio is not accurate. These include patients with mitral valve disease, heavy annular calcification, constrictive pericarditis, and abnormal septal motion, as you saw. Now we go to the time interval that we mentioned earlier, which is the delaying of the annular early diastolic velocity. This is from an animal model where relaxation is normal. At baseline, if you look at when E prime and when mitral E velocity happening, they are happening almost at the same time. In fact, in normal hearts, the longitudinal expansion frequently precedes the opening of the mitral valve and mitral inflow, okay? After circumflex constriction and the development of LV dysfunction, you end up with a lower E velocity, makes sense, systolic dysfunction, smaller stroke volume, smaller TVI, but we are more interested in that annular early diastolic velocity. It is smaller, and that is fitting with other slides that you saw already, but notice here that it is delayed compared to the mitral E. This delay in the time interval has been related to the presence of diastolic dysfunction, impaired relaxation, higher minimal pressures, 
and increased filling pressures as well. So the timing is of value. This delay in the mitral early diastolic velocity results in the velocity taking place when there is the diastasis period, equal LA, LV pressures, and therefore it is not affected by the absolute LA pressure value or absolute LV pressure value. Correct, so E happens earlier, but longitudinal expansion is delayed. The one event that is not delayed in the setting of this ventricle is the change in the cross-sectional area, or the changes in circumferential strain in early diastole as well. So a diseased heart gets delayed longitudinal expansion. And the driving factor for the flow across the mitral valve is the higher LA pressure, not the drop in the LV pressure. Albeit, LV pressure is still dropping. Because these events happen, you, the way we record mitral E and annular E prime, we are recording them from different locations, from different cycles. It would be advantageous to try and record them from the same cycle, and there are some systems that are available that would allow you to record these from the same cycle. This is a study from a Japanese group of investigators that were able to acquire, to use a dual Doppler probe and record mitral inflow and annular diastolic velocities from the same cardiac cycle in patients with atrial fibrillation. When they did so, that is the single cycle method for acquiring both velocities, you see a good relation with wedge pressure. On the other hand, if they were to average multiple beats, so varying RR intervals for the mitral and for the annular velocities, you end up with, although a significant relation, yet a much lower correlation. So that method is useful. Also that dual Doppler probe, as you can imagine, would allow you to measure the timing of delay of annular early diastolic velocity much easier than having to look at different cycles and try to match RR intervals, particularly in atrial fibrillation. So far, we covered tissue Doppler velocities. We talked about their limitations. We covered mitral inflow, pulmonary veins. And these are the routine measurements that we get. We look at PA pressures, TR and PR signals, if you have them. You also look at the presence of LV systolic dysfunction, present or absent, LV hypertrophy, presence or absence. We try to integrate all this data in arriving at conclusions. Are there other measurements that we can look at? Now, more fancy measurements? Yes. The question is, what do they add and in which group of patients? Why do we look at selective use of these? Is because they have typically lower, sometimes lower feasibility in inexperienced hands, lower reproducibility, and therefore wider scatter in the data if you'd say apply it to any lab that doesn't do them routinely. The slide shows that diastolic strain measurements during several periods in diastole. The red and the blue curve show the recordings by velocities or of velocities from the annulus. On the other hand, the purple one shows strain. So there are the systolic velocities, then there are the diastolic velocities below the baseline as we are accustomed. The yellow line marks aortic valve closure, the green line marks mitral valve opening, the time interval between them is the isovolumic relaxation time. So you notice early and late diastolic velocities and for strain we have early and late diastolic strain rate and during the IVR you have also uh, diastolic velocities and you have an IVR, isovolumic relaxation strain rate. So it is possible for us to measure these. You can measure strain rate in segments, segment by segment. So if you are interested in segmental function, say patients with coronary disease and you want to diagnose CAD, you can use that. You can also use this in the whole myocardium, in all segments that you see in each of the apical views, and then you come up with a global parameter. So several investigators have looked at these. Some measured longitudinal strain, some measured circumferential strain, and strain rates, diastolic strain rates, with variable results. <laughs> 
This is one of these results done here in animals showing a good relation between relaxation and the diastolic strain rate during the IVR. This is the IVR signal nicely illustrated here and also early diastolic strain relates similarly with the time constant of LB relaxation and negative DPDT. Similar to the concept of E to E prime ratio, you can use mitral E velocity to strain rate, be it in early diastole or during IVR. This is an example showing the IVR measurement at 0.08, which is reduced. A ratio that relates with filling pressure. And this is work from Hisham Dukanish looking at the early diastolic velocity and the measurements of diastolic strain rate. If you use strain curves, which is possible, it is more challenging to identify that early diastole. So some investigators have looked at the strain rate and tried to match the time interval where they measure diastolic strain as the time interval of peak E velocity. It is also possible to use it as the highest value, which may not be at the same time as the E velocity. So you can end up with slightly different values and slightly different correlations. But these are examples. This is how strain rate in early diastole relates with mean wedge pressure and the time constant in patients. Significant but inverse relations and with a wider scatter, as you see on these slides. Not necessarily adding much. The challenge for using strain rate of the ventricle is that it needs higher quality signals. You need good myocardial visualization. Certainly experience plays an important role in acquisition. You need decent frame rates in the 40 to 80 frames per second if you're using speckle tracking as in this case. More time will be needed to analyze in comparison with the velocity measurements. And if you're looking at fast heart rates, this is not there will be underestimation and sometimes inability to record some of these signals unless you acquire the strain signals with tissue Doppler, which is another approach but more tedious. So we covered strain of the ventricle and its limitations. How about looking at myocardial function using another parameter and here uh, looking at rotation? It is possible to record rotation of the heart. The heart has a ringing motion where it undergoes a counterclockwise rotation. When we talk about rotation of the ventricle, you are looking at the heart through the diaphragm. So a counterclockwise rotation is designated with a positive signal. A clockwise rotation is a negative direction. Basal rotation starts with a nut counterclockwise, but then the major rotation is happening clockwise and has a negative value. For the apex, It is the other way around. It starts clockwise, but the net rotation is counterclockwise. The difference between them gives you the twist, and you can calculate twist rate and untwisting rates. Early on, there was a thought that twisting rate and untwisting rate would be abnormal in patients with myocardial disease and normal EF. We and others have shown that this is not the case. As you see here, compared to controls, twisting rate and actual twist are very similar. In comparison, patients with depressed EF, these values are depressed. What are the determinants of how fast the ventricle uncoils? It depends on the twist. A ventricle that twists to a good degree and twists fast will also untwist to a good degree and untwist fast. Systolic and diastolic function are related. So these relations are not necessarily unexpected. More interesting is the relation here. So if we speak about the untwisting rate as a parameter of relaxation, it should relate inversely with the time constant. And yes, it relates inversely in depressed EF. But at normal EF, you see a scatter plot with no relation. This was shown in patients. This was shown in animals by several investigators likewise. On the other hand, the relation with the end systolic volume is more consistent whether EF is depressed or normal. Notice that ventricles with a larger end systolic volume, these are ventricles that have less recoil, are associated with lower untwisting rates. So one can ask the question, why are ventricles with large end systolic volumes have lower untwisting rates? So this is the reason. 
One of the important proteins in the myocardium in the sarcomere is titan. This is a large protein that stretches from the Z line into the middle of the sarcomere. And it has several components that you see here that are coiled one over the other, made up of tandem immunoglobulin-like repeats, as well as a series of four amino acids that are coiled together. If you stretch the myocardium, so in diastole we are straightening these segments, you end up with a longer sarcomere and you see a stretch of these segments in this direction. So this part that was coiled all over here, you can see it stretched all the way there. How about if we do a compression with the ventricle contracting? So here it's happening, but in the opposite direction. Instead of it going that way, it will go the other way. And if you relate the sarcomere length to the passive force, as the sarcomere length increases, that passive force increases. Turns out there are two isoforms of this protein, a form which resists stretch and is associated with a good recoil, like if you have a stiff spring, if you try to expand it, to stretch it, it will stretch with a lot of resistance, but then when you release it, it recoils back fast. On the other hand, if you have a string that is already stretched and you try to stretch it, it may stretch with you easier, but then it recoils less. This recoiling is what determines the untwisting rate. We looked at this relation in patients where the heart was available and where twisting was measured from the apex, which is the main contributor for the untwisting that is happening in the ventricle. And what the slide shows that the more of this stiffer isoform of the protein, the higher the untwisting rate. Negative values represent more untwisting. Less negative values represent less untwisting. So now we've established why the end systolic volume is a determinant with the of the untwisting rate and how it relates to the proteins that make up the sarcomere. Are there other variables recently that have been looked at for assessment of diastolic function? Yes, left atrial strain. And left atrial strain can be measured with tissue Doppler, can be measured with speckle tracking, more reproducible with speckle tracking probably. But again, the limitation of the heart rate should be considered. Fast heart rates, better tracking happens with tissue Doppler. And what we're looking at here is the strain curve from two regions with tissue Doppler, one in blue from the lateral wall and one in yellow from the septal wall of the atrium. During systole, the atrium is expanding. It develops a high strain, and then it drops, and then you end up with another positive signal with atrial contraction. If you want to look at a counterpart to this strain curve, you're looking at the atrium expanding in systole, increasing its volume. So it's more of a surrogate of the volume of the atrium. We can get strain rate curves from the strain, Again, strain rate tends to be a bit more noisy, so reproducibility is typically higher for strain as opposed to strain rate. Can we use strain signals to gain inferences about LV filling pressures? The answer is yes. This is a nice study that the investigators had a decent number of patients, more than about 100 or so, where they measured LV EDP as well as mean wedge pressure. They used high fidelity catheters and they had measurements of peak LA strain. And what you see is patients with higher filling pressures, be it wedge or EDP, have lower strain during systole. They were able to show that this relation holds whether EF is normal or depressed. These were patients, all comers to the cath, but did not really include patients with mitral valve disease, pericardial disease, bundle branch block, the other variables. If you were to think about LA strain, certainly it circumvents all of these variables I talked about because the other variables primarily influence LV function as opposed to LA function, unless you're looking at patients with, say, pericardial disease adhesions that involve the atrium. Can we do a diastolic stress test? Yes. There is interest in the diastolic stress test, but there is little data in terms of large series. Most of what we have are small observational validation studies. This is the earliest publication from the Mayo Clinic. 
they took a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and they tried to predict what happens with the left atrial pressure with exercise. Let's look at the cath recordings first and then we'll look at the Doppler recordings. What you're looking at baseline is LV aortic pressures, lower down is the LA pressure, the patient has no gradient. So LV systolic, peak systolic, L aortic peak systolic pressures are the same. Mean LA pressure is 17. This patient has a prominent V wave. The patient exercises, systolic pressures go up. That's a normal response, still no obstruction. But notice what happens to mean LA pressure, almost doubles from 17 to 31 with a very large A velocity. Atria have large A velocity, large A V uh, pressures, not simply because of MR, but also because they are frequently stiff, atria. Did, they, did these findings get reproduced by echo Doppler? Let's look at the mitral inflow. The mitral E velocity kept increasing with exercise, whereas the annular early diastolic velocity stayed flat and reduced. As a result, the E to E prime ratio was elevated, and this persisted into recovery as well. The investigators here used a supine bike, which is an ideal approach to record these signals because you have enough time to get 2D as well as Doppler, but it is also possible to use it in the post-treadmill time during the recovery phase. You've acquired your regular 2D scanning that you need to look at for wall motion, and once you've acquired that, you can then acquire mitral inflow and you can acquire tissue Doppler signals. Notice that in recovery there is no merging and you are able to record separately early and late diastolic velocities. Does that the ratio relate to mean LV diastolic pressure during exercise? This is a study from Tom Marwick and his group published a number of years ago showing the relation with exercise. And yes, you see a significant relation in the open circles between mean LV diastolic pressure and E to E prime ratio. And this investigator, as well as several other investigators, looked at predictors of exercise tolerance and consistently, one of the important predictors was E to E prime. In fact, this is an interesting study looking at the ability of E to E prime ratio with exercise to predict events above and beyond clinical variables, 2D variables, wall motion abnormalities with exercise. You see a significant jump in the chi-square from 26 to 34. So is there a simple approach to grade diastolic dysfunction? There is a simple approach, either normal or abnormal to start with. To decide on something being normal, you have to look at everything. It doesn't come because you have an absolute value of say E prime of eight or nine or whatever. You look collectively at what you have. Example, a normal individual, young individual, no other clinical history, 2D findings are normal, LA volume is normal, annular velocity is normal, mitral inflow normal, that's a normal heart. Say they are in a setting of hypovolemia from volume loss, vomiting, hemorrhagic loss, the annular velocities in these patients can be reduced because, of the, because they are dependent on load in a normal heart. That patient should not be labeled diastolic dysfunction. If you have an older individual where the annular velocities are lower and commensurate with what fits that individual's age, they are not necessarily having diastolic dysfunction. Our lab uses the, ter the term impaired appropriate for age. With age, there is some decline in diastolic dysfunction, mostly in individuals who are not physically active. It has been shown that individuals who are physically active, even if older, they can have normal velocities still. So that's the first step. Are we looking at a normal or an abnormal heart? Then we have to grade, and similar to several things that we grade, there is mild, moderate, severe. We called it grade one, two, and three. And these grades are not fixed. The patients can get better with treatment, for example. They can get worse with progression of disease. So it is important when we look at a study also to go back and look is there a change in the grading of diastolic function or the function is stable or getting better? 
In the normal heart, most of the filling is happening because of the suction effect, rapid LV relaxation. In the diseased heart, most of the filling for these grades 2 and 3 is happening because of a high LAP. And here you see the pseudonormal and the restrictive filling patterns with reduced annular early diastolic velocity. Notice that with restrictive filling, the late diastolic velocity is also reduced, similar to what you see for the mitral inflow. Why? Because these patients have very high late diastolic pressures and EDP that results in small velocities. This is the classification or an approach to look at prediction of filling pressures in patients with depressed EF, looking at several parameters, but mostly dependent on the mitral E2A ratio. There will be updated guidelines that will simplify this approach. So people will not have to look at so many measurements, much fewer measurements, but you will have to be more critical of the quality of the measurements that you get. And basically, if you have a ratio less than one and a E velocity that is less than 50, most of these patients have a normal LAP. If you're looking at a depressed heart or a heart with LVH and restrictive filling, LAP is up. In between, you need to consider other variables. The more important variables, I would say, in depressed EF are the pulmonary veins and PA pressures. I think I'm running out of time and rather take questions than keep going on. So let me ask you then, where are the challenges that you face when you try to draw conclusions on diastolic function? What are the things that bother people the most, that confuse them the most? So technical quality. So if you start with a technical quality that is challenging, that signal should not be used in what you will do other when, in what you will use to draw conclusions. Other We had them in earlier slides. So if, if they are low, you know, you've got to be careful. There's no high filling pressure when somebody has a PA pressure systolic of 20, 25. Right? So you have to be very careful. So when you have high filling pressures, you need something So two points. I think discrepant data, how to deal with them is important. And this is where a person needs to look at everything collectively. Sometimes you can, with discrepant data, arrive at a conclusion. Sometimes you cannot. The new guidelines will open the door for a situation where a report would come indeterminate for LV filling pressures or indeterminate LV relaxation. So these will be allowed, yes. The problem, however, is many people sometimes will take the easier route. Example, you have a mitral inflow where the sample volume, which is purported to be at the tips, is somewhere between the annulus and the tips, and you have a mitral E of 60, but if you were to go to the tips, the mitral E is a 90. 
okay? Now you have an annular velocity that is sort of borderline reduced, an eight, or say a six. And if you combine it with a 60, it, you have a ratio of 10, whereas if you combine it with a 90, it's a much higher value. You have an LA that sits at, say, 38 mLs per square meter body surface area. By the way, the 2015 chamber quantification guidelines now recognize this value as an abnormally elevated, okay? And you have a TR, say, that is 2.6 or a 2.7. So it's also on the verge. It's not that TR of a 2.1, 2.2, 2.3. So now you put them together and you say the LA tells me it's enlarged. The LAP should be up. And I look at the annular velocity E to E prime ratio. It says it is borderline. What do I do? I don't do anything. A more critical individual would look at it and say, okay, the LA is enlarged, but this is not a good quality signal. Is there something else I can look at? And now they look at the pulmonary veins and they can see additional findings to support an elevated LAP. If you just stop at these two and you do not critique them carefully, you may end up with a number of situations where you sort of move away from it. Yeah. Is that the early, which one? The flow chart, yes. This is for depressed EF. So the LA is, this is the other issue with the LA. So there are two issues with the LA. One is a technical issue, and this is something that we and others have seen a lot. Sometimes you end up with foreshortened LA, and you can look at studies done three days apart, and you have one where the LA is 90, the other one where the LA is 40, because the LA is foreshortened. Unfortunately, without, say, that previous study, I may look at this study, and I think it's a 40, and it's fine. So that's one issue with the LA. The second thing is many of these hearts have had, with depressed EF or with LVH or with HCM, they have had episodes where there is diastolic dysfunction and increased LA pressure. So the LA is increased. The LA volume is increased. You can diurese them, and the LA volume may decrease but will still remain elevated. Because of that, for these particular guidelines, the LA volume was not included in this. With the new guidelines, albeit again with caveats, the LA will again be looked, will be recommended for the depressed EF, but there should be caution exercised. Are you looking at a good measurement of the LA? Correct measurement, that is. There was no foreshortening. Second, do not take it in isolation. Look at other parameters. Basically, you want three of four variables or two of three available variables present before you move on to conclude LAP is increased. Yes. I mean, by, by definition, the left should have a low refractive index or something really wrong, right, in, in the measurement of that. And that E over A ratio with some IBRT which should give you, I mean, just like you, know, you validated this 10 years ago, should be plenty most of the time. React to that. So, what you have is on these guidelines, sort of these extremes again, is okay you will see situations where you have a ratio that is less than one. This is the tricky part of a, using a ratio less than one, but the absolute E velocity is not reduced. It's something like 80 or 90. And now these patients may have an elevated LAP, hence the subset where you want additional information. And PA pressure should have to Absolutely. So the So if you have a normal LA volume and you are happy with it, this is a good acquisition, this is a correct measurement, the odds are very high in patients with cardiac disease that their LAP is normal. Okay, but if the LA is enlarged, look at other variables as well to confirm your conclusion. If you go to the PA pressures, 
it's good to look at the history of these patients. Sometimes you have patients referred with pulmonary disease, known pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary parenchymal or vascular diseases. The reason for it, be careful with the PA pressures in this situation. If it's a clear-cut cardiac patient, no pulmonary issues, and you have elevated PA pressures, they are usually elevated because the LAP is up. Yes? So with aging, E prime drops, okay? And E to E prime ratio may increase. If you look at normal individuals that have been published, and we're looking at people, say, up to 70 years of age, not older than that. And I'll tell you why not older than that in a moment. You are looking usually at an average E to E prime ratio less than 15, and at a lateral early diastolic velocity in the 8 centimeters per second range. These values can be seen in normal individuals. The challenge is the following. This person may have diastolic dysfunction, right? And you can get these values with an enlarged left atrium with a high PA pressure. So just because a single variable falls in the normal range doesn't mean that they will have diastolic, normal diastolic function. You have to look collectively at what is present. Perhaps a nice comparison is look at patients with heart failure preserved EF. They have a normal EF. Does it mean that they have a normal cardiac function? If you were to measure their longitudinal contraction, say the systolic velocity by tissue Doppler or global longitudinal strain, they are reduced. So obviously with the appendage, you exclude it, you exclude pulmonary veins, you don't go all the way to the annulus. If you go from apical 4 to apical 2, you should see rather similar atrial areas. It is possible to go lower intercoastal space, do more posterior tilting to get to the LA and see if that makes a difference. I think the presence of previous studies should be looked at carefully in these patients to see if atrium that was 90 and all of a sudden now it's a 40-50. This is not even diseased hearts when there is remodeling. This doesn't happen. It's a technical variable. But obviously, what you're saying is on the same day, two planes really help you. One is way off. The By Done. It's done many times. Is the study is 
the subcoastal views for the LA volume. Speaking with about CMR, I think CMR, even their normal values are higher, much higher than what we recognize as normal. Our upper cutoff has been 34 ml per square meter. I think their upper normal is, may well be over 40. Is that correct? 50 ml per square meter. But I think it's something worth looking at. We can see how these actually compare. Yeah. Mostly because of the time, there is there are many other things that have been done. Some old, some new. Flow propagation is useful in patients with depressed heart. In normal hearts, normal ejection fraction, normal size ventricles or small size ventricles, it can look normal even though relaxation is impaired. So depressed hearts, you can use it with E to flow propagation velocity ratio. Thank you. Thank you, guys.